Hello everyone, this is Jack from Visual Effects Hut. So today I want to be talking about the Octane camera and some of the settings and what they all mean. And then show you the universal camera as well, because that's pretty cool. So for this example, I will be using the viewport renderer, which I don't really do much, but it's just going to help us move around a little bit easier. So we've got our scene and I've started to overexpose scenes a lot with the light so that it really creates real intense lights, just like it would in real life. And then just bring down the settings in camera. So what we need to do is just need to create a camera. To show this tutorial off um, and the settings, it's probably good to do a close up. So if we frame up something like this. First, we just want to get the exposure right, just so that it looks a little bit nicer. So to do that, we just need to go into our camera imager and knock the exposure down until we get something that we like the look of. You can stop these highlights from peaking by using highlight compression or equally, if you're in an ACES workflow, it'll probably naturally be okay anyway. But as you can see, it just helps that ground contain more information and highlights if this was a real light -like character. Yeah, so the camera imager contains everything about the camera in terms of post-production, so like exposure, um, LUTs and vignetting and that sort of thing. So I've just imported one of the LUTs that is from our new pack, the creative pack, just to show you that you can kind of get an idea of what you're going to get as a final image if you was to grade afterwards. So we want to go for like a desaturated but like grey brown look that happens to be... Um, a good LUT for that kind of thing is called grey mood and obviously when it comes to exporting you just take that off and you can add it on in, again in post. Then the only other t thing that we'll look at in here is white balance. So this has a dramatic effect on the colours of your image. So if we just click this and we just say that this is white in our image, you can see that it's kind of changed it so it's a bit more pink. But like depending on what colour you set this to, you can get quite quirky looking results but we do actually want that to be just white. So the white point is just the white balance of the camera. So what it, the camera thinks is white. And then the only other one I'm gonna look at at the moment is vignetting, which is this one, which tucks in the sides and creates like a mask around the image. So we'll have a little bit of that, but not too much. So from before and after. Right, so if we go into our uh, thin lens now, we'll see a few drop downs and we want to open these up just to kind of show what's happening. The f-stop is the same thing as the aperture so the how much light you're letting into the lens which also equates to how much depth of field you get, how much blurry background or foreground. Um, so if we just turn off autofocus for now and we just change this value to probably 1.4. So by changing the f-stop it automatically changes the aperture which in turn creates more depth of field. The default value which starts at 2.8 actually isn't on 2.8 until you activate it or move that slider. You'd notice because everything's in focus and at f2.8 stuff would still be blurry in some places. So I'm putting this on f1.4 which equates to the 1786 again and then obviously the lower this value, the more depth of field you get. Try not to go too crazy with this because people think, yeah, more blur is good. But the problem is anything past 1.4, most lenses go down to 1.4. So we all as human beings used to seeing images with roughly 1.4. When you start trying to take wider shots and you're still on this aperture, you can make things look quite small. Let's show you an example. Like I said, 1.4, that's okay. You probably wouldn't take a shot like this on f1.4 though. It'd probably be about f8 or f4. But some people go crazy and crank this all the way down. So if we wait for this now, so 0 0.5, which I don't even actually know if that exists. I know 9.5 does. But now, the background's out of focus, the foreground's really out of focus, and just the middle's quite sharp, which creates that illusion that it's quite a small little city. So if he's going for that vibe, then you could do this. But in, 
unrealistic aperture values or f-stops can create this miniature look which isn't right if you used to really crank it even further using the aperture again 12 you'll really see what I mean it looks like toy tone so that now doesn't look like a full-scale city it looks tiny looks like a little toy and again if you paired that with the wrong angle angles like this it's going to look like you're shooting a little model so just be aware these values can be quite creative but also if you're going for photorealism try not to go too crazy because depth field does look nice it does but too much of it can create the opposite end of the spectrum where everything starts to look small even though you're in a physically accurate render engine no lens really goes to that f-stop anyway not as of yet and even if it did even if we filmed in real life with an f-stop like that things would look small because it's almost borderline tilt shift but as a rule of thumb 1.4 1 1.8 2 2.8 3.5 4 5.6 and 8 are kind of good f-stops to use for your scenes so the last thing i want to cover about the f-stop and aperture is it works in conjunction with the focal length as well so as you can see this is a really nice looking shot but if you wanted a a different amount of depth of field but you wanted to stay within the legal limits it's worth changing focal length and pulling the camera back as well to get more realistic results so if I just copy and paste this camera and we change this to a 50 mil now we get even more depth of field because we're on a tighter focal length so if we just move to reframe as you can see the background's more blurred and again the other thing that works in conjunction with the depth of field is the how close you are to an object so if we got a lot closer to our statue the background's thrown out even more because that's just the way that lenses work it's trying to focus on something closer to it so it throws out the background even more so the aperture Although f1.4 is low, will look different across different focal lengths. And the longer the focal lens, as in the bigger the number, the more depth of field you will get. So this is looking really smooth and buttery now. So focal depth is literally what part of the image is in focus. So at 518 centimetres we're in focus, everything else isn't. So it's literally just the distance um, from the lens to the subject which is in focus. So if you wanted to do macro stuff you could have this quite low. But again, if we do want that mannequin to be in focus, I will just go to our camera and put the figure in. So just keeping that in focus. And then back to the other settings. So the aperture aspect ratio is the little circles that you get in the background are formed because it's a spherical lens which just means it's circular and the image that's printed onto the camera sensor is a circle if you was using anamorphic lenses which is the ones that create oval bokeh and that stretch the image you get a slightly higher number between 1.33 and there's probably some more severe ones but more than two is ridiculous so if we just change this to 1.8 what we'll notice is the background looks stretched and the blur is stretching up and creating more oval circles rather than circles let's just make that 2.2 it's not doing a grand job and I will crank the exposure up just so that we see this sort of thing a lot clearer so you can see it's creating that stretched more Hollywood look that you see on some big budget films where they've actually got the money to spend to use anamorphic lenses because it does create imperfections but it does create that great look of a wider field of view and oval circles in the background. Uh, moving on to the aperture edge 
So this is just how sharp the bokeh is. So a bokeh, for anybody that doesn't know, is literally just the circles in the background. And yes, the aperture edge is just how sharp that those circles are pronounced. So if we crank that value up massively, it's three, it could start looking quite messy and busy. Especially here, you can see like each circle overlapping each other and it looks quite messy. More expensive lenses as well will have a lower value in real life. Just because it's more smooth and creamy rather than sharp and yucky. And then the blade count is literally how circular you want that bokeh. So again, more expensive lenses have more blades. And it's just so that they, they can get that bokeh when the aperture is fully open to create a full circle. So if we just create one, an average of about 12 or 13, it should look a bit smoother. If you did three, it would be like almost triangle shapes instead of circles. So aperture rotation, you're not really going to notice any difference in this scene. If you had a few little dots lights, you might start seeing what's happening. And then the aperture roundness is as it says. It's pretty smooth and nice and round if you do all the way down it'll be a bit more blocky but again this isn't a, a very good scene to see these two settings in particular so it was a little bit more squared if you noticed so the only thing left i want to show in the thin lens now is the distortion so another property of an anamorphic lens or just not any lens in general will be some some distortion that helps make the image look a bit more photo real so we'll just add a bit of distortion and show what's happening as you can see now, that's cranked to one, and we can see that edges are starting to create like curves instead of being straight, which helps that anamorphic look as well. So we've got that distortion on the edges, and it really does help sell that extra anamorphic look from having the distortion set to one. The Pixel aspect ratio is literally just kind of like a de-squeeze kind of thing, so you'll see it squishes the image, which you then could export again in post and unsqueeze the image. So that's the distortion on the thin lens. So it's a pretty cool camera, but it's not as good as the universal one, so let's jump into that now. So I've duplicated the camera. Keep everything the same, but we're going to change this to a universal camera now. So everything stays pretty similar, apart from you notice that the distortion's gone. And we've got a few new settings, which is pretty cool. So let's jump into some of our new settings. So if we go to optical vignetting, we'll start with the simplest. What we'll notice is if we do this, pull this in, we start to get the lens not covering the full sensor so it's almost like you're using a lens that's not designed for that camera or it's quite vintage so it's covering too much so it creates a real vignette that's actually on the lens not a post thing so everything will naturally get darker so what we want to do though is we want to just make this you do get it in anamorphic lenses quite a lot so we will actually have some not too much though keep that number quite low because it does look pretty gross it's different to a post effect like I said and if you did notice it was oval and again that's because of our aperture set to 2.2 if we set that to 1 it'll be a circle so changing that back to 2.2 so we get the anamorphic look and then we just took that in and get a little bit of a vignette but not too much so this is actually happening in the lens not and once you've got it that you, you're almost happy you can use the scale to kind of like just push it out to the side a little bit spread it out it looks a bit nicer now still probably too strong okay so we've gone for 0 0.1 and just because i like nice neat numbers 1.5 so we won't use the fisheye but i will actually show you the split focus so if you just enable this what happens is at the boundary width of 0.5 that side's in focus, That no that side's in focus, that side isn't. And you can play with these settings until you get a look that you're happy with. 
but it, I feel like it's a bit of a gimmick. I don't, I can't understand the use for this because the blur. Although it feathers nice, it's still not realistic. But you can get split dot focus dot to filters for the front of cameras for like quirky effects. It's probably good for like fashion films and stuff that's a bit quirky. Um, and then let's jump into distortion. Now this on the universal camera is so much better. So we can have spherical distortion. First, like we'll just ramp it massively so you see what's happening. You can see it's like bulging the lens a little bit. So it's pushing the center of the lens, which is good because there's a slight imperfection there. And again, this is good to do in subtlety. And barrel distortion is going to be like tucking in the sides of the lens. So let's have a look. You can see it's like pushing in and getting a little bit more field of view as well, but it is creating curved lines, which helps one again, the anamorphic look or an imperfect lens or a vintage lens. You can actually go into minus as well with this one. So you can pull it so that stuff close to the lens gets wider, which again, that can potentially be a property of some anamorphic lenses. So we will go a little bit crazy on this because this is a good example. And then barrel corners is literally the corners. So you can start tucking them in as well. So you can kind of re-level your shot up again. So you create a weird distortion, which creates almost like a little splat pattern on the lens, but it's created now an imperfect frame. So if we go from that, which is quite straight and does look computer generated, even though there is distortion on that, to this one, there's a little bit more movement in the lens, which is pretty nice. And again, you can crank these values to crazy amounts if you want. And then next up is the aberration. So these are a little bit weird. So we haven't got color um, aberration yet, but I believe it is coming and it's probably going to happen in the thin lens rather than the universal, but we will see. So these are kind of imperfections that are going to change how soft images look and in certain places around edges and like how close you are and things. So let's have a look what happens. So it's so spherical aberration. I'm yet to see what that does unless there's a specific scene that that works with and then coma we'll move on to that this creates like a, a motion blur zoom in look not under i don't understand what how this would happen in real life but you can get some quite neat looking results as well so this would be good for like so if someone's drunk or ghost vibes or even if you was doing a fast scene and you wanted to cheat a little bit of motion blur i've done this in the past to make it look like the ship's flying quite quick so that's quite useful for that. Just not, don't just go as ridiculous as this because you get some weird results. But if you just a tweak it a little tiny, tiny bit as well, helps. But again, in our scene, there's no movement. So it's a little bit confusing as to why that exists, unless he was on a horse. So we put zero, zero, 001. So just have a subtle amount. I don't know how you say this, astigmatism will create almost like a swirl around your image. So here you can see now, especially on the edges in particular, you can see that it's all going in a circular pattern. So here stuff going around like this. It's a little bit more blurred and there's a bit more there's more chance of having bokeh, so if there was a wet floor, you'd see lots of little circles here. So yeah, that's that's pretty cool as well. And then field curve, which is kind of like a an expansion on that. So if we just crank that, it's again just like that swirly motion, but more blurred and more soft than actual like causing the to get bokeh little circles everywhere. So it just softens everything, which is not necessarily keen on. So it looks a bit fake. So hopefully you found this extensive camera tutorial useful and learned something. If you've got any more questions, just drop them in the comments below and I'll hopefully get back to you if I know the answer and just happy creating.